Good evening, everybody. Shane, thank you so much, as always, launching us successfully with a big smile and great competence. And we have two thank yous. We thank Shane of 2020 Innovation and Jakana, the Savvy Tree Spotting Books, and of course, the Tree App. Um, we hope you enjoy today. We worked really hard. We've tried to make it simple and straightforward. And we want you, if you've got your app in your hand, please is to make sure that you set on original. It mattered before, but in this one particularly, we really are dealing with a lot of words that you need the original um, to work with. I want to share an inspirational thought with you, first of all. We've talked enthusiastically about discovering indigenous trees and the joy it brings, the fun and the adventure outings. But what I haven't focused on yet is that there's a completely new extra layer that actually brings the greatest pleasure of all. At least it does for me. It's great to have a checklist and know how many trees you've discovered in South Africa. And then the odd new tree pops up and that's great excitement. But for the best moments on a regular basis, as we are driving somewhere, out of the corner of my eye, I see a flower or a fruit and I yell, Pete, stop, stop, go back, go back. Uh, grinding of brakes and squealing of tires, I leap out of the car with ready at hand secateurs and chop off a twig. For me, those are the most incredible moments. From the very start of learning to ID trees, you can add deep pleasure when you dis discover the tree, the flowers of the trees. Not just to ID the tree, but discover and understand the flowers. And then perhaps have the privilege of watching the process of development and finally seeing the fruit. It's hard to explain, but it is one of the most intense moments of awareness each time you find a new flower in your hand by a busy roadside, maybe with lorries going past, and you've opened up a whole new world of connection for yourself to a fascinating life force. It, it's a very spiritual moment for me each time. Now tonight, the first obvious thing to discuss that you all know already is that pollinated flowers develop into fruit. We all know that, but very few of you, because I know from my own experience of myself, very few of you will naturally apply that thought to your newly developing focus skills when you look at either flowers or fruit on a real live indigenous tree. But at the end of tonight, you undoubtedly have super new observation skills for flowers and fruit and you will master what we're about to teach you. Now, I want you, if you've got the tree app loaded and you're on this um, main screen, then go onwards to the search tree. You all know how to do that now. And then go on to flowers. We've highlighted the fact that we'd like to start with colors. It's a pretty easy um, starting point. And here are the colors that we, we offer. Across the top, it says a single flower, colors of any parts, multiple entries possible. Now we just want to say we've decided on a lot of recent research, but that just adds to problems. And next time you have an update, that will have changed to say, choose one main color that you see as the dominant color of the flower you're holding in your hands. Aside from that small issue, this is a really useful entry. Mm, it's easy and it's useful, but there's a little spot of bad news. Nearly 73% of tree flowers can be white or yellow. But still, when you start with 1177, even losing 25%, or not 27%, of the species in the list is useful. Now, I want you to keep that place in the app. We're going to move on on the screen, but don't you change your app. We're going to go for a moment and look at a real life picture. Pretend it's 3D, it's obviously flat. And this is a rose flower bud. There are three easy, very easy concepts we need you to understand. And you'll probably be really familiar with all three of the words anyway. But we're going to be using these words constantly for the next 20 minutes or more. These three concepts are part Parts of the flower that are not directly responsible for any actual reproduction changes, but they need it before the flower can start to change into a fruit. 
So we look at the top and we have the calyx. And in this extreme left bud, the calyx is still closed around the petals and the flower, keeping it safe. Once the flower bud starts opening, it, not always, but often, it splits. And these are separated parts of the calyx, and they're now called sepals once they split. Once the sepals split open, we can see underneath the petals. This is all very really childish and simple, but uh, we're going to use these words such a lot. The petals are still all for, furled up inside. You can see the pink and you can see the pale yellowy color there. And then finally, our third item is the flower stalk. I'm sorry I was so slow and pedantic there, but you, you'll see as we go ahead how important it was. You've stayed on flowers and colors on your app. And if you now look across the top to that green bar that says flowers, you'll notice a small eye in a black circle. And that indicates to you something of, of really great importance we haven't touched on before. Throughout the app, as long as you're in original, there is a series of information hotspots explaining how the app works and what the botanical meanings are for many app entries. If you touch on that little eye, what will happen is that something looking roughly like this will come up, depending on whether you're in Apple or Android. And this is the beginning of the botany course, and we're in flowers. If you look, maybe you have to scroll. I want you to get down to this thing that says reproductive parts, and you will look at the picture that's similar to this, not identical. We've adapted this for tonight's talking. Now we're back to those three very simple concepts again. We are back to the petals and the flower stalk and the calyx or sepals. Now, this is the only time we're going to make a big fuss about it, but inside there are the reproductive parts, the pistil and the stem and the male and the female parts. But we, the way that the app, the tree app works is we don't have to know a great deal of focused botany and botanical terms to be able to identify the tree through the flower. So the re non-reproductive parts were the three we started on, and these reproductive parts are less important. Now, please don't move off your information hotspot. We're going to come back to it in a minute. But again, I'm going to continue in the app and don't bother to follow me. I just want to say that there are two major things, major parts that we want to look at. We want to look at flower group types and we want to look at individual flowers. And we want to learn, understand what is the difference between an individual flower and a flower group. Now, I know flower groups is at the top, but we are going to start with individual flowers, shape and kind. We have here words that are ordinary English. The very first thing the tree app set out to do was not, not to use words you would not understand. We used words that are easy in your normal English language. Star-shaped, poppy-like, cup-shaped, tube, trumpet. None of those are difficult concepts. Now we're going to take that picture here and we're going to translate that and see how that unites with what we learned on the previous slide. Star-shaped, these petals are separated. Cup and bell-shaped, these petals are united. So let's start on the left and go through. Star-shaped has separated petals and they're pointed. So when that opens up, this flower obviously is cut in half. When that opens up, we've got a star. The next one, poppy-like, these petals have rounded petals. They are separated. And so it's separated poppy-like. It's this flower. Here they are in the real. Here's your star-shaped cross-berry raisin. And here's your poppy-like broadleafed moth fruit. Those are the separated petals. In the united petals, we get a cup and a bell shape because of this united form. And it's quite short and um, a little chunky, but your tube and trumpet has a much longer section to it. If we look at the reality, our magic worry has these sweet little small, aha, guess what, white, and also our water tree, Erica, white. 
cup or bell-shaped flower and the water tree erica is longer and more tube or trumpet-like. Now, we didn't really put this into the first part of the talk, but I, I feel I have to add it in. So there isn't a diagram, but you're just going to have to use your imaginations. Just to complicate our lives, this cup and this trumpet can each develop separated petals on the outside. And you can actually see this starting to form in the magic quarry. You can see the beginning of a separated petal. It's not just a smooth cup like that you could drink tea out of. And in our tube and trumpet, our water tree Erica has actually really got quite cute little indentations into actually flaring little petals. So there are variations on what you're seeing here. We're now going to look back. You can return to your, um, to your information hotspots and you can keep scrolling and you should get to a heading. It's a flower with prominent petals. Now, this is the one that basically we've already done. And it's got prominent petals, meaning those petals are larger than the calyx, the sepals. Now, just remember back to my moment of enthusiasm at the beginning. This is what you're learning. So when you stop by the side of the road with your secateurs in hand and you pluck this little flower, you're going to yell something exciting like Eureka. You're going to be so excited by what you see. It, each flower is different, and it really is an adventure to look at it and to realize what these differences are. So here's our three-leaved rhigosum, which has got a tiny, relatively tiny little calyx at the bottom, opened into sepals, and nice big petals on the top. Scroll a little bit further down your information hotspot. I hope you're all managing just to scroll with your fingers. And we now see an unusual form of flower with prominent, prominent sepals. And in our diagram, you can see the sepals are much bigger and longer, and your petals are tiny little things, even shorter than your reproductive parts. Now, one of the reasons we've bothered to put this bit of complication in is that trees are really quite, um, they're, not, they're not very helpful. Many trees have very strange flowers. Um, it's not like a petunia or a rose <clears throat> where they make thousands of beautiful flowers because they need to reproduce and reproduce. Trees only need to make a couple of babies in a year, and a lot of their flowers are really unusual. Now, this low felt star chestnut, Stoculia murex, there are no petals at all. This very pretty yellow and red piece, these are the sepals of the calyx. So you will find this useful. I know if you haven't looked that hard before, you'll wonder why we're going on about it, but this will help you. Scroll a little bit further down in your information hotspot, and here's a flower with equally prominent separated petals and sepals. It's our very beautiful quilted blue bush, Diasparus lasioides. It's one of our most widespread trees in the whole country. And here we see that the sepals are just about reaching the bottom of the petals. When we look at it from the top, it's a very pretty little flower because the petals fold right back and then the sepals come up around the side. Now, what you've been exposed to is our information hotspot botany course at the back of the app, and it's always there. It's not on every single entry. This is showing you its leaves. <clears throat> we have it in flowers and in fruit. It's there for unusual roots and for sizes. Wherever you're stuck in the app, look and see. And if there is a little information hotspot, you can click on it and it will give you the lowdown on what to do next. It's incredibly useful and lots of people use the app and never, never even find it. Right. Now we can go back. Um, to the app if you like. I do actually suggest that you abandon the app. We now need to go quite ra rapidly and you can follow. Marie and I have really worked hard at giving you everything on the slides and maybe just sit back and enjoy the presentation. And you've had plenty of weeks to learn to handle your app and to get good at it. And you've got the holiday weeks ahead to get even better. So this is our very familiar um, home screen. We hit the tree search button. And then tree search, we're looking at flowers again. 
We looked at the individual flowers that had separated petals and sepals, and you sort of had a pattern there of you expected that the, what the petals would do and you expected what the sepals would do. Now, these are a different set where they really are very different. Um, but let's check again. Pincushion, you all know pincushion. You know sweet pea, you're going to learn euphorbia. Fig, you know. So all of these are really common words. We quickly look at our pincushion like, here's our little leaf stalk. I'm oh, sorry, our flower stalk. I told you we'd come against it. And here's our calyx with the little sepals. Here's our reproductive parts, and there are no petals. But you've come to expect that that's a possibility. And so we go on down through the list. Now, this is a moment of extreme delight for me. When we made this six and a half years ago, I said to whoever the artist was, please just create for me a little diagram that says really unusual. Make it, don't make it look like anything that's a real flower. Just create something that if somebody finds the, treat, the flower they're looking at doesn't look like anything else, they'll click that this box here. Literally about six weeks ago, I was in the Kruger area and I have a deck outside my bedroom with a pot of mahogany growing over it. And I looked down on the floor and I found these. And that is the pot mahogany flower, Evzalia consensus. And look at this. That's what they used to create this unusual logo. I, I'm sort of embarrassed and smiling and laughing at myself. The, the, the thrill I got when I found this flower, and then a few days later, I hope you're all clapping your hands with delight. There's the beginning of the fruit starting to grow out of the place where the um, sexual reproduction units were. And Marie's going to go into all of that and describe the development of the fruit. So after such a long time of learning trees, this, this was a eureka moment for me. It was very, very, very exciting indeed. Right. <clears throat> this is the message of tonight. Learn, in fact, it's three or four messages. Learn what you can expect to see and then learn to look really carefully and then learn and remember what it is you're seeing. It's just a matter of a new focus opening your eyes. Now we've done colors and we've done individual flowers. So now we're going to look at flower group types. Flower group types, there are a lot of them and we've divided them into easy to swallow groups. There's this group here at the top then where the tight spike starts, that's another group below it. And then thirdly, we'll de deal with this great big group there on the side. So to start with, we're going to look at these three. Everything here is a flower group type. There are lots of different ones. So we have here solitary, cluster, and unbranched. Now I'm going to quickly deal with this funny word, solitary. How does solitary fit in with a flower group? Surely something that's solitary is not a group. Um, at the time, I was working with Dr. Robbie Robinson, and he used to get very agitated and tell me I was completely destroying botany, and I couldn't possibly do this, but we did it. Because in the end, some flowers join onto the twig. I wish that was bigger, and you could see that it's brown. Perhaps you've got it big enough, you can see. And there's one flower on, guess what, a flower stalk. And so it is solitary. And so in a way, it is its flower group type although the word solitary makes it seem a nonsense, but it's not, it's important. The next kind is clustered and the next kind is an unbranched or branched collection. Now here's our solitary. We're using a small honey thorn. This is one of the most, also one of the most common um, little bushes along the side of the roads throughout South Africa. Meg Palgrave once told me it was the most common um, honey thorn in the country. They happen to be amongst my favorites because they've got wonderful red berries and these purple flowers, and you can see them right through the Karoo. So watch out for them. So we have here a solitary. It's a single flower on a very short single flower stalk, and it attaches to the twig. The next kind is clustered. Now here we have the twig, and we have three flowers, and each one has its own flower stalk. And those flower stalks all join the twig at what is called a node or a 
uh, it's a, a live point where something can grow. They join clustered or the, the botanical word is fascicled into that one point. Your solitary was alone, your clustered are together, but each one has its own flower stalk. Finally, we have the flower group type of an unbranched or a branched collection. Now let's start with what's this word collection? Basically, it's any old fashioned word that many tree books have used over the decades, meaning head, bunch, cluster, group. When we set about trying to create this new way of identifying, we found, and we did a lot of research into it, that each author probably does mean much the same thing when they use the word cluster or they use the word bunch. But the problem was, and we did a huge amount of research, there was simply no cohesion between what one author would say if they used the word head and what another author would say. If these, the, those words, bunch, cluster, etc., are not botanical words. And there actually wasn't a, a common word that was generally used. We chose collection because it wasn't used before, and so we've tried to make it our own. Now, two kinds unbranched or branched. So here we have, there should be a twin at the other end that this is joined to, and here we have our flower group stalk running down the length. Here we have the flower group stalk of the branched collection. In the unbranched, each flower is attached to the flower group stalk by its own flower stalk. Again, I'm being a bit pedantic and a bit um, maybe talking down, you feel I'm um, making too much of a meal of it, but it really does make a difference when you go out into the field and when you read our notes and you'll see comma on its own flower stalk, comma, attached to the flower group stalk, comma, and see how carefully we have tried to describe the difference. This one here has the flower group stalk and it branches and the flowers are then attached to that branch. Now the good news is that in the end we haven't asked you to differentiate between an unbranched or a branched collection. We have basically said as long as it's either an unbranched or a branched collection and this is the little image that we used then you you tick that that image. Right now Here's another moment of Eureka for me. It's one of those moments that came very late in my tree um, identifying career and gave me the most, a, a real big jolt to think I hadn't known it before. Many individual flowers, housing all the reproductive parts that they need to make an individual single flower, single fruit, are absolutely minute. And you can only see them when they're using, if you're using a magnifying glass, or looking through the back of binoculars. These tiny flowers need to collect together to make a flower group, or the botanical word is inflorescence, that is large enough to create an ideal environment for pollination. Now this might be because it's wind pollinated or an insect can crawl across these tiny flowers or even maybe like animals like bats can bump into them. Now this was the eureka moment for me. That if we move on to this second group here of tight spike, tight ball and pin cushion, I have never understood that when I looked at a knobthorn acacia and that is a tight spike, this was hundreds, hundreds of small flowers and each flower Thank you, Joan from Gox for the drawing, looked more or less like that, with the calyx at the bottom, maybe some petals holding it, and the reproductive parts being the fluffy part that you can see. I, do, I didn't understand um, that concept, and I certainly didn't understand the information that's about to come next. So that's your tight spike. This is your tight ball. And those of you who know your acacia karoo know that this is your a lot of um, acacias look like this. Interestingly, if it's got a ball-shaped flower, it's got a long spike as a thorn. 
back to our tight spike, it's likely to have a short hooked thorn. So this ball shape here under a microscope looks like this. This has been cut in half, by the way. So, of course, the flower should be coming across the front of us here, but you can see so clearly, beautifully, how each of these single flowers looks like Joan von Gogh's drawing. And, and this flower will be pollinated. And this flower, and maybe this flower. Sometimes none, sometimes many. The pin cushion is very different. Now, when you first look and you see this fluffy thing with a lot of stamens, you just think, oh, well, you know, it's a lot of stamens. But if you understand the idea of the tight spy, the tight ball, the pin cushion, even with this small short introduction over a Zoom session, you will look at these fluffy little flowers and you'll have a new ability to focus and understand what's going on. So now here you can see a single flower as these are all single flowers. And here you can see little buds that haven't yet opened. The last part of this flower groups, we did the um, first two parts. Now this part is a group of flowers that all have a, a genus or a family that they belong to. So it's quite daunting because it's long, but again, it's simple English. It's concept you know. Um, the top one is a fig with flowers inside the fruit, and then there's an aloe. This is a big surprise to everyone, the protea, three lines down. That's actually a flower group. It's not one single flower. We call it a protea, but it's composed of many, many flowers that can be turned into seeds. The sunflower's the same, the thistle, and so on down, down that whole list. Here we see real live pictures of them. The knobbly fig up at the top right hand corner has flowers inside. Each of these little yellow things on the deadliest tree euphorbia, they look like individual flowers, but they're not. That center is made up of many, many flowers in a flower group. Now here's the very big information we've touched on, that each pollinated flower can turn into a fruit. One of the things I'm always tempted to do is to go into flowers and see how you remember we said there were different ways of it attaching to the twig. There was solitary, there was clustered, and there was in a branched or unbranched um, collection. And you would think now that the fruit would follow suit. So I want you to look at the bear bear up in the top right hand corner. It's a single flower. And yes, Eureka, there's the fruit, a single fruit hanging on a single fruit stalk. If you look down to the bottom right, the pod mahogany, and there's my flower, the one I discovered. Thank you, Joan van Gogh, for drawing it so beautifully. You can see that little red flower it has the little buds. So that's like a branched collection, or maybe it's an unbranched, but it's a little collection. And here the pods are coming off and they join the twig after they've been on similar fruit stalks. But if you go to the top left, to the large fruited bush willow, and you see that tight spike with its, we've already said hundreds of flowers, you would expect that that pod, the four winged pod of the type of the um, bush willow, there would be a bunch of them. And often there are. But fruit are very unreliable. Fruit are bought quite easily, they get eaten, they get parasitized, they get bumped off, they get wind blown off by the wind. So you can't really look at a single large fruited bush willow pod and say, ah, oh, obviously that is a flower that grows on a single, single flower stalk. It's not as simple as that. Right. This, I said I had a eureka moment of discovering that uh, these things with large clusters of flowers turned into fruit. And it was actually looking at um, the sickle bush, um, Dicrosacus cinerea. Now, I know this is not the favorite of a lot of people, and I want to just make a point for any of the farmers who are listening, that this is not an invasive species because it's indigenous, so it can't be called invasive. It's actually called an encroacher. And yes, it's a plant that takes over when the land is damaged, 
um, disturbed, and then the sickle bush comes in. But but it's not invasive. It has to be a, an alien that's not part of South Africa to be termed an invasive. But the miracle here that really, really make your heart sing is that the pretty picture that Marie managed to find, you can actually, if your screen's big enough, you can see the individual stamens and um, of, of the flowers. And any one of those that is pollinated has the possibility of turning into one of these wriggly, contorted, twisted, combined beans that make up that tight ball of a sickle bush fruit. And I'll leave that with you, just to remember the next time you see our invading, sorry, our encroaching sickle bush, smile to yourself and think, I understand something I never understood before. Right, Marie, and I'm handing over to you to deal with fruit. Okay, welcome. I'm going to show you a sequence of photos now that illustrate the development of a flower into a fruit. So the example I've chosen is a, a lemon tree. You all know the lemon tree. And in favorable conditions, a fertilized flower develops into a fruit. That means male pollen landed on the female parts of the flower and fertilization occurred. And fruit development starts in the female parts of the flower and the fruit will develop on the exact spot where the flowers are. So you can see the nice pretty white flowers and there's the pollinator, the bees, and they are pollinating the flowers. You will see the tiny beginning of the green fruit where the rest of the, and the rest of the female parts. And you can also clearly still see the calyx at the bottom. So the fruit is developing at the bottom in the female part. And here, the moment the fruit starts to develop, the former flower stalk we will now call the fruit stalk. So it was the flower stalk, and now we call it the fruit stalk. So the moment you see the fruit, we now call it the fruit stalk. And often, uh, parts of the flower remain. You can here very clearly still see the calyx. The calyx is quite visible here. So while the fruit develops, and we will see later on, we can have persistent flower parts. And on this one, it's quite um, obvious that at the, at the top, you will see there's a tip. And that sharp tip at the end, that is the remains of some of the flower parts. So when you look at the fruit again and you see that sharp tip at the peach or like in this lemon, this is where the rest of the female flower parts were. You will see now our flower has turned into a mature lemon. Okay. So when you go to your app home screen, you press the tree search and then press on fruit and you, this screen will appear. Just a note in the original version of the app, which we are going to use, the fruit features are based on what you see. You will see um, when we go into each item, it is based on what you see. Just a note in the botanical version, you will see that the fruit is classified in a different way. So on the top, the first item that we're going to look at is the distinctive fruit features, families and genera. And when you select that option, you will find a list of families that can be easily recognized by their fruit. So this is a very useful and easy section if you know the family or genus that the tree belongs to. Some distinct families are so easy, especially if the flower or fruit are present, such as the fig tree or aloe and pine cones. So you will see this is a very easy, uh, a quick way to have a look. And even if you don't know the families, just open this one first and see if maybe some of these resemble what you are looking at. And the entries needed after this name is mostly very simple to enter. The next option is color. And like with the flowers, it's really easy to fill in. And remember the color is based on a recently ripened fruit. So this is not useful when the fruit is old and desiccated. So immediately after the fruit has reached maturity, then this is the color that you can allocate. The next option we're going to show you is shape and size recently ripened. And this section is specifically based on what you see. So not the formal classification of the fruit, but what you see visually. And this is divided, we divided it into three parts, so two with the dots, the symbols on the left hand side, that is fruit that is either too tiny to describe accurately, or it is fruits where the, the shape is not, is unusual. So the other options is simple, so there are two at the top, and then multi-part. So we are going to quickly have a look at these sections. So the first one of the individual fruit too small, we're not going to show you that, you can um, have a look at that in your app. And the next one we're going to have a look at is any other shape that is not listed above. So these are unusual shapes. 
And can you see our three examples? There are various options such as square, star shape, triangular count, and so forth. And it's shown here in the middle, the square fruit of the southern lala palm. And then again to the very left hand side, the fruit of the Chinese hats. And the fruit is inside. And the hat part that you can see is actually the persistent calyx. So there is an example where the flower parts uh, play a main role. So the next group that we are going to call simple fruits, and it's divided into two kinds. The first one is simple with no lobes, no wings, and no parts. And these fruits can be round or oval, elongated, kidney-shaped or nutlet-shaped. And you can see the options there to the left. The examples shown here are the elongated fruit of the sausage tree, the round fruits of the broad-leafed shepherd's tree, and the kidney-shaped part of the camel thorn acacia. So this is one fruit, and you cannot see any clear delineations that have multiple parts. So then you select this simple option. Then we are going to have a look at still simple fruit, but they have wings. So it's still a simple shape, no lobes and part, but there are wings for seed dispersal. So the options on the left hand side, which you can choose to help with identification, is size, number of wings, what the wings are made of, etc. So very useful. The three examples shown the kiot, bloodwood on top, as such distinctive fruits. If you see this, then you cannot go wrong with the with the species. The winged fruit of the russet bush willow, and just to note here, the different fruits of the bush willows vary quite a bit in size, with a large fruited bush willows fruit up to 10 centimeters in length. So that is when it's very useful to add the fruit size. And the Cape Crown's ash clearly show the wings that are needed for seed dispersal. And then when you go to the next group of species, these are the multipart fruits, and they have multiple parts, either fused or separated but they are joined at one point. So the first one we're going to look at is the multipart fused with similar lobes. So in the glossy bursama at the top, the green unripe fruit, you can see four clear sections. And when the fruit is ripe and it's split open, you can see at the top, it reveals the three seeds. So you can clearly see it consists of four separate parts or four Parts that look similar, but they are combined. So that's why we have it as fused. The forest croton in the middle also show obvious delineation of its three sections. But the example at the bottom right, we put that in for you to show that this looks simple, but there are lines indicating that, the that there are sections and they are not always clear. So a good way to decide if you're wondering what type of fruit it is, is to cut it open and then you will see on that lines, you will see similar sections. So if you open it, you will see that they are composed of multiple sections. That's if you're able to cut it open. Some of them are quite hard. Okay, and then the next group of the multipart, we are going to look at those um, with separate sections or lobes that are visible, but still joined at one point. And these fruit have clear separate parts, very visible. At the bottom is the two horns of the winter impala lily, and less visible in the round clustered fruit of the African sage orange. Each section looks similar and are attached at one point, but the separate individual parts are also visible. So this was lots of flowers that then developed into this clustered fruit, but it is a multi-part fruit. And you will again see you can... Um, decide on the different shapes, the number of the parts, the size. It's a very good way to filter your number of trees. We are going to quickly show you the next items in the main fruit list, which can also be very useful information. And the first one we're going to look at is the feel, the texture and consistency of recently ripened fruit. So if you look at the options available, there is the thin skinned, hard, is it woody? Does it feel brittle? So there you can have a look at all these options and all based on what you can see and feel. And then the next useful characteristic is the surface features. And this is any fruit. So any type of fruit, you can use the surface features. These use ordinary English words that have specific meanings. Hairy, velvety, knobs, warts, it look hot in wool, it's sticky, it's spiky. So just give it a try and see where you end up. So we try to be as visual as possible and 
if you see any knobs on a fruit, then you can check that one. And then for any type of research and characteristics you are looking at, focus. And remember, when we go back to the first session, focus. Don't panic. Trust yourself. And the, the worst that can happen is that you can't see a tree in your review list. And then you just start again. And a very important idea, please go to your apps and then you just select an, a random number of any of the features. You go to the home screen, the tree search, and then any uh, enter any tree search sticks that you feel like. Enter about five tree search sticks. What will then happen, and that is shown in this screen that I have here, at the bottom right, you will see a review button and the number five. That five means that you have now made five selections. And when you press on that review, this will show you all the selections that you have already made. So all the choices you made earlier, each one with an X, and you can click on the X and that selection will disappear. So this is a handy way when you've made a mistake and you don't want to go through the entire list again. Maybe you've done 20 selections, then you can just go to review and you select whatever one you want to remove and that removes the filter and other species are automatically included again. And very important, at the bottom right, the, it says tree search. So if you've made a selection or you're happy with what you have, when you click on that tree search button now, where the review was, this will take you back to the tree search and then you can go on and re-enter a new option. On the extreme left-hand side, you will see reset. Reset means it completely clears all of the selections you made. If you made a lot of selections and you want to start again, you just re press the reset button and all your filters will disappear. This is not true for location. So if you want to clear your location, you have to go to location and then set it to all of South Africa or whatever selection you want to make there. But the reset button clears all of the filters. So if you just want to remove one of them, don't press reset, press review. Okay. Yeah, and the main thing we have to say here is just play with the app. I want to now take a quick time to put in an advertisement for so the fantastic Tree Listers SI website. This is a completely free, fully interactive online indigenous tree checklist, which is available when you have an internet connection. And the fun part of the website is the completely optional ranking page where you can compare yourself to others. And I just want to show in our top 10, this is the latest from November, we have Eugene Mole in the top spot with 1,022 trees. That is absolutely amazing. I don't know if anyone will catch up to him soon, but the second Lester, you will all know her. She's my co-presenter, Val Thomas, and she has got almost 700 trees. And now we know why she has so much knowledge and passion for trees. So please come and join in the fun by adding your name to the list. This is inside the tree listers website. When you edit the tree list screen, you can set your primary and secondary languages. The first example is the primary language scientific, the secondary Afrikaans. The second one, the second option is English and Afrikaans. And then the last option is that English with the genera. So you'll see it is sorted by bushwallow and then Cape climbing flame forest. So you can have it in any way you would want. And it is as easy as clicking on the on the box next to the name. So when you click it, that is automatically added to your list. And it is completely optional to add the provincial location. You can see none of the provincial locations are clicked in the examples here. But if you want to add your provincial location, you can just click on the province and it will add where you have seen it. Okay, and that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marie. And just while we're on tree listers, I'm going to say that we've obviously been presenting to you very much as the tree app people, but our primary deeper commitment is to encouraging people to get involved in indigenous trees, which is why we obviously still join forces with um, Jakana and with Sappy Tree Spotting. We want people to learn and love and conserve in indigenous trees. We'd love a community to start developing where people like happens in birding um, and somehow we tree people have got left behind. So this tree listers is one of the really wonderful ways that we can share excitement and interest 
Um, Marie didn't mention that this new number of 1022 from Eugene Moll is brand new. Um, he was under a thousand just literally a week or so ago. So it was a big excitement when we opened our apps in the last few days and found that um, Eugene's bounced up to over a thousand. It, it really is a com very simple competitive idea and we'd love you to all get involved. The other way that people can get involved is a few weeks back, we mentioned to you the difficult trees um, in the app, and those were the ones that don't have any data to search by. They have the name, English and Afrikaans, they have a map, and they get searched by the location search. So that's amazing, they pop up. But all you, you get is their name and their location, because we don't have enough data to be able to draw the drawings and to enter all the information. So now today is a wonderful thing to open my email and find that Mimi and Herod have sent us the information for Searsia Batafilla. And I meant to look up the common name and then I forgot, but it's a, it's a Rus. And this way too, if any of you find anything to comment on in the tree app, any problems, any information that you think is needs to be explored, send us an email and discuss it. Dodi sent one today, Dodi, sorry, thank you very much, saying he didn't find bark in the tree app. And I want to say, if you go to your screen, your tree search screen, and you go to other information, you will see there tree bark. It's not very detailed, but the colors are there. And Marie did explain last time that trees vary so much in age and place and weather and um what's happened to them in their lives, that you really can't reliably tick off colors or forms or textures in tree bark. But it is there at a very simple in, um, level, but it is there in um, other, other features, other information. So there are lots of ways that we can all go on communicating and helping one another. And Marie and I are just here at the end of um, an email, ask at the tree app, .co.za and we will do our best to answer you maybe not through the high holiday week but we'll do our best to keep in touch with you. We'd particularly love it if you sent us emails if there was anything that you'd like us to put into a webinar next year we're not doing any more this year um, <laughs> but we certainly would like to cover anything else that you feel maybe it's a recap of some of the stuff we've done this time, maybe it's some other aspect of the app that you feel needs clarity. Yeah, I see Francho um, asked, is there a possibility of an online course with a strong practical component? That's definitely the type of thing that we would look at next year. So we'll definitely keep that in mind. Of one question, some of my neighbors have orange colored lemons, usually thick rough skin. Are these really lemons? Why are they orange instead of yellow? With hybridized fruit, that is, people do a lot of stuff and you find orange lemons and lemon oranges and all sorts of weird stuff. That's definitely an, an hybridized thing. So it can actually be a lemon, but yeah, I think the, it will be the taste test. If it's sour, then it's a lemon <laughs> of some kind. But yeah, with mm. especially with commercial fruits, there is such a lot of hybrids out there. Okay, and is there a link inside the tree app to the tree lister site? Yes, if you go to sightings and you say sync sightings, there's a button at the bottom which is visit the tree listers website. If you have a lot of sightings in your tree app, then you can sync the tree listers website with your tree app sightings. So, and that is the way you can do it. And also from the tree listers website, you can sync it also if you have sightings. Marie, just hang on one sec. Just you brought up something really important. A lot of people get in touch with us once there's been an accident and they've lost their phone or they've lost their tablet and it's been stolen or dumped into a swimming pool or something and they've lost their sightings. If you're interested in your sightings, if they mean a lot to you, please learn how to sync them. If you're struggling, get in touch with us, we'll help you. Once you've synced those, they're synced back to our major website and then we keep that. And even if you lose your phone, your app is registered to your email address. And it doesn't matter whether you're 
um, as long as you stay with the same platform. So as long as you stay with Apple or you stay with Android and you use the same email, email address, you can never lose the app. It will come up when you buy a new one. But unfortunately, we haven't yet found a way of keeping those sightings if you haven't synced them onto our website. So that's a really important bit of information pass on to anyone who has got an app. It's heartbreaking when people have got a lot of sightings and they lose them. Yeah, so based on that, uh, yeah, no, there was a question, what's the difference between the tree list and sightings? So that's what we sort of talked about now. The tree list is what is inbuilt in, in the app. So that's the list of all the trees. And depending on what tree search and filters you use, that will it will reduce the number. But the full list is there. And sightings is... In, if you go to an individual tree, you can press sightings and then you can record your sighting of a tree. But if you go onto the, on the home page and you click there on sightings, you will have the option to sync your sightings or to go to the website. So that's a way to record your sightings and you can have photos and add a trip blog and there's quite a lot of interesting things you can do there. And next question is any features that focus on smell and taste? We don't have that as a as a main feature, but in all of the information, if there is an interesting thing that says it smells unpleasant when you cut the bark or when you whatever, that is included in our information. So it's not in the main tree search ring, but you can definitely read about it if it's something that is quite distinctive or characteristic of that of that plant. Can I chip in? Um, when we first created the app, one of the things that is a real problem, it's the same as bark. The minute you have something that is personal interpretation, like color, like texture, like smell, it's almost impossible to put it into a list where people can tick. I think it's peppermint. My husband thinks it's lemon. Somebody else thinks it's lavender. And you just lose your tree. And one of our dictums, our absolute rules was we didn't add anything where people might lose their trees. So as Marie says, it's there in the words, in the information, but we never found a way of um, making it something that you would actually take a pity because it would have been very nice, but it doesn't work in reality. We did test it. Thank okay, you. Okay, and then, yeah, and then another question. We noticed that there was no search option for a grooved leaf stem. Is this characteristic to variable or too common to be diagnostic? Depends on where you that. are. Yeah. No, I can yeah. answer it's coming, yeah. coming. Um, it's already, we've got it in the botanical, and it's just one of those things that we didn't add in the very first few versions. And yeah, I certainly hope it's going to be in quite soon. The various things that leaf stems can have, they can have glands, they can have hairs, they can be grooved, they can be bent, they can be thickened. Um, and certainly it's one of my ambitions that early next year we'll add that as, as part of it. But it's Thank definitely you. a way to enhance your botanical knowledge to go then to the botanical app and to have a look and see what what is available there as mm -hmm. well. And you can use that interchangeably. So simply click on the one and click on the other one. Okay, and then you when will... You can't, interchange, you can't interchange your search. You can't no, no, start yeah. your... You use search one app completely and, then, and use another app. Yeah, yeah. you can you can use use the two to, to check out information. Very good idea, yeah. yeah. And then a question for Val. When you say look through the back of the binoculars, doesn't that make it smaller? What trick am I missing? No, it um, it actually magnifies. So if you look at, instead of looking the normal way, you turn the binoculars round and you place the little leaf or whatever it is you're looking at in your hand and you look through the binoculars backwards, it enlarges it. It's a good trick. The other way of enlarging things is to use your cell phone camera and stretch yeah. the um, stretch, stretch image, and you'll be absolutely amazed at the things you can see on a leaf stalk, the hairs, the glands, the tiny little ant walking along. So that's the third way of mag magnifying very easily. One guy asked about the price of the app. So the, there's a free version that 155 three. So when you download it, you can evaluate that. But then you can also buy the app on Apple or Android. And at this moment, it's 180 um, rands per year. So you can just go to our website or you can go to the Google Play Store or the App Store for Apple. And then you can just subscribe to the app. Our very deepest grateful thanks to you all for listening to us all three nights. 
and your appreciative emails and your comments, your queries. We enjoy criticisms as well because that helps us to improve. Shane, thank you. Thank you, Shane. Thank you. We really, thank really you. appreciate it. Uh, yeah, a I, I, deep appreciation. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for participating. And just uh, well done to you, Val and Marie. I think you two ladies have done a fantastic job. Thanks, everybody. Have a thank you. Evening. Thank right. you. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Take care. Cheerio. Bye. Bye.